I'm sure that most of you already know that Kent Hovind, the young Earth creationist, has been released from prison recently. I'm not going to pass judgment on whether he deserved to be in there or not, or how serious a crime tax evasion is. I'm also not going to claim that everything he says is wrong or nonsensical. For example, he argues that the Earth is not flat and that the solar system is heliocentric, and those are points we can agree upon. But I am going to focus on a few things which he has said in a YouTube video he posted recently, which I argue are seriously flawed. Take it away, Mr. Hovind. The idea that dinosaurs turned into birds is so stupid, it's almost... I can't think of anything dumber in right now at 2.30 in the morning or whatever time it is. It's dumb. I mean, like, real dumb to think that a dinosaur turned to a bird. I know that was the deal with Jurassic Park, you know, the, they're flying off in the helicopter off the island, and they look at the pelican, and the guy's thinking, wow, that thing used to be a T-Rex, and that is just real, real stupid, in my humble, totally unbiased, and completely correct opinion on the topic. So every animal on planet Earth produces after its kind. Birds produce baby birds, okay? Reptiles produce baby reptiles. Uh, lions produce lions. There are no exceptions to this. None. Regardless of whether a person thinks something is dumb or not, we need to evaluate an argument on its own merit. Notice how Mr. Hovind is stating the obvious by pointing out to us that animals never give birth to different species, or kinds, as he puts it. Every farmer on planet Earth counts on evolution not happening. I mean, they count on it. They plant corn and they expect to grow corn. When they crossbreed their cows, they expect to get a calf. There simply are no exceptions. And to say it happened long ago and far away is stupid. It's not happening now. And no, it didn't happen long ago and far away. It didn't happen ever. Notice how he throws in far away with long ago, as if those two things were comparable making it sound like Star Wars science fiction or something. The scientific theory of evolution requires long periods of time, but not huge distances. All of it took place right here on planet Earth. Dinosaurs were big, huge lizards that lived with Adam and Eve before the flood came and lived up to the time of Noah. Noah would have taken them on the ark, probably babies. He'd be smart enough to figure that out. You don't have to bring the biggest one you can find. Bring two babies of everything. Why would you bring big elephants? Why would you bring big anything? Just bring babies of everything. In order for any of this to make sense, we must automatically assume that his brand of biblical literalism is the only correct one, and that it is the only lens through which we can legitimately interpret prehistory. But, if we instead tentatively assume that the story of Noah's flood is mythological, then there is no conflict with geology, biology, history and anthropology. So whether the character of Noah in the Bible story put babies or fully grown animals into his boat is a mute point. And I, I heard now that the Bear Monology, Bear Monology Project, which is to try to see how many kinds, not species, how many kinds of animals are there in the world, they used to have a number like 8,000. For those of you who haven't heard of Bear Monology, it's a branch of young earth creationism, regarded by them as science, but by the rest of the world as pseudoscience. Someone told me just a few days ago that they're now with all the research they're saying there probably are less than 5,000 kinds of animals in the world. Like you have dog, wolf, coyote, jackal, hyena, they're probably the same kind of animal and may have come from a common ancestor. Unlike Ray Comfort, Kent Hovind does seem to understand the concept of common ancestry. There may be hope yet. Some people choose to call that microevolution. Uh, I don't know that that's a good term, but let's, let's assume it is. Let's start with microevolution. Okay, well, Noah could easily fit 5,000 pairs of animals on the ark. He didn't have to take fish, of course, or bugs. They can survive on floating log mats and debris on the outside. Really? Does that include termites, ants, bees, and other insects which live in large colonies? How about mosquitoes, sandflies, clegs, and midges which require fresh blood? How did they survive for a year on floating debris? What about coral reefs and tropical marine fish, which require very stable environments to survive? Invoking a global flood raises far more questions than it answers.
But God told Noah to bring all those in whose nostrils is the breath of life, all those on dry land. I mean, read the story in Genesis uh, 6 and 7. I have read the story. It defies logical scrutiny. It doesn't explain what the fountains of the deep were, or the windows of heaven. Nor does it explain where a billion cubic miles of extra water drained to on a spherical planet. So, the idea that Noah, could, Noah couldn't fit them on the ark is, is, is simply, uh, uh, the idea that he could not fit them is, is crazy. Of course he could fit them on an ark 515 feet long, or whatever it was. Uh, easily, on one floor of the ark. Plus, he didn't have to go around and feed the animals if they were all vegetarian, like the Bible clearly says in Genesis 1, uh, 28, 29, 30, says all the animals ate plants. I thought animals became carnivorous after Eve ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. According to that divinely inspired and inerrant book, some 1600 years before that global flood. Noah, like, like farmers today, will drop off a couple of bales of hay out in the field and let the cows go find it. Sure, they all ate hay, including the hyenas, polar bears, vampire bats, and theropod dinosaurs. Have a pond where they can go get their own water. My uh, father-in-law took care of all kinds of cows out in his pasture, and he didn't have to go hand-feed any of them. Drop off a big bale of hay, and uh, they got a pond down there, and if you can't figure out how to eat and drink, well, then you ought to die and be somebody's hamburger. Is that supposed to be Christian compassion? I guess it doesn't extend towards other species. Uh, so the animals on the ark were not even in cages. They were just in rooms. I mean, read the story. I've read the Bible. And in Genesis, chapter 6, verses 14 to 16, it mentions gopher wood, pitch, three floors, a window and a door, but there is no mention of cages. Noah put the animals on these rooms, and these, they found their own room probably. Build the ark with a bunch of rooms, and the porcupines go in and figure out which one they want to live in, and the uh, horses go stay in the one they want to live in. And when you're hungry, go, get a, go eat from the bales of hay, or whatever's out there, or the piles of vegetables, whatever Noah had. Excuse me? He's making it up as he goes and not. No, I'm not. So the flood story is very reasonable. They, they could get off the ark now, and these kinds of animals begin to move to different climates or different areas. And they would diversify automatically. The ones that happened to go to cold areas, only those with thicker fur would survive. Those that go to hot areas, would, the, the, the gene pool becomes selected for whatever's best for that area. If you took all the dogs in the world today and turned them loose in Alaska, just take them all, turn them loose in Alaska, within five years, you're going to find all those that are not designed for cold weather are dead and therefore not reproducing. And so all, only those animals with thick fur, a uh, 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 husky type animal, are going to survive. That's all that survives in that area. The area doesn't create the husky. The area selects the husky gene characteristics out of the dog kind gene code. Although this is a bit garbled, Mr. Hoven does seem to understand the concept of evolution, although, as you will hear in a moment, he adds more and more confusion to it. If you turned all the dogs in the world loose in uh, uh, Australia, the, the dingo-type animal would, is the only one that would survive. It's got long legs to stay away from the, the, the heat of the desert. It's got thin legs. It's got a thin body style, thin hair. The thing which Mr. Hoven doesn't seem to understand is that domestic dogs were bred from wolves, not foxes, jackals, hyenas, or coyotes. This can be verified morphologically, as well as genetically. It's best adapted for the uh, desert. That adaptation certainly works. Natural selection certainly works. But natural selection selects. It doesn't create anything. It can't. Uh, so it only selects what's available. Mr. Hoven seems to be confused by the idea that all of the genetic information, the phenotypic variation, was contained within the organisms from the start, and that it continues to be diminished and degraded as time goes by. This is not how the theory of evolution works, nor does any individual give birth to offspring of a different species, as Mr. Hoven implied earlier. According to the theory of evolution, Offspring are always of the same species as the parent. Species are defined as individuals which can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Because of this, there is no clear dividing line between one species and another. For example, 
Mr. Hoven's great great grandparents were Homo sapiens, just like he is. But if we go back 50,000 generations, then those ancestors, although hominids, would not be recognisable modern humans. Every generation is slightly different from the previous one. These small changes do not and cannot be defined as different species, but the changes are cumulative. So, over long periods of time, the changes between individuals becomes more noticeable. As far as natural selection goes, the sticking point seems to be the bogus idea creationists have that the complexity of life is somehow running down, or as they like to put it, they think that the information within the genome only decreases or degrades. The main problem for people like Kent Hovind is that he is doctrinally bound to believe that there have only been 6,000 years for these changes to occur which is not enough time for much speciation at all, among large plants and animals. When scientists examine the geological, astronomical and biological evidence objectively, they overwhelmingly reach the conclusion that the Earth is billions of years old, not thousands. I say they've been trying to get faster horses for a long time. Do you think they'll ever get a, a horse faster than a, a, a F-16? Don't be silly. <laughs> I bet there's a limit in there someplace. So they're selecting, not creating anything. So This selection versus creation thing is drawing on the confusion between evolution and abiogenesis, where creationists argue that evolution can't explain the origin of life. We already know that. That's why the theory of evolution deals with descent with modification among existing life forms. This should not be confused with abiogenesis, which deals with the emergence of life from chemical processes. Unlike evolution, which is well understood, abiogenesis is a lot more speculative, and is therefore more of a hypothesis than a theory. Birds did not come from dinosaurs. You can tell them sweetly, Kent Hovind says that is stupid. And if they believe birds came from dinosaurs, I have got a bridge I want to sell them. Uh, please have them give me a call on that. Okay. Regardless of whether Kent Hovind is a bridge or a snake oil salesman, the fact remains that all modern birds are descendants of some ancient dinosaurs. When he says came from, he is drastically oversimplifying the theory of evolution as described by modern scientists. This irritates people like me who actually care about factually accurate information being presented to the young and impressionable. But Mr. Hoven probably knows what his paying followers want to hear. <laughs>